What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The H Panel, the show where I bring on guests from all different backgrounds to talk all the things mental health. I'm your host, Harry Pavan, and there is such a quick turnaround in episodes today because I have the pleasure of being joined by a really special guest named Hans Bend. Hans is the founder and inventor of the recently launched company, Breathing.ai. This company uses changing fonts, changing screen colors, and more to help elevate your health and mood while you're using screen time. Hans was so fun to talk to, and this was a really interesting conversation, so I wanted to thank him again for coming on and having this discussion with me. Also, if you've been listening for a while, you know the drill. Before we get started here, please like, comment, share, subscribe, give five stars if you're on a podcast platform, share with someone who might want to hear this episode. It's a really great one, and I cannot wait for you to listen. I'll talk to you all very soon. Have a great rest of your day. Peace. I'm Harry Potvin, and this is the H Panel. Hannes, thank you so much for joining me today, man. Oh, thank you so much much for having me so how did you um how did you get into this line of work like what inspired you to start this um i was really um depressed and anxious for a long time i working as an artist and as a researcher and i wasn't really um aware of that that was my norm in a way and then i just found a lot of happiness through mindfulness meditation yoga and that got me really into you know sharing that as much as possible, but knowing that a lot of people would not buy a yoga mat and do it or have the time for meditation. So I always wanted to see how we can make that more accessible. And that's got me into technology, running a business. And, um, and also, you know, you can still be creative there in a way. And still, I consider that part of my art practice. So it wasn't far away from what I was doing. But um, yeah, I really want to share like, you know, happiness and helping people feel happy live a happier life and healthier so that was um that was a little bit limited with what i was doing before including my own personal life so now now i feel like much happier and i I just want to you know have other people feel feel similar about life Mm -hmm. i love that and in a world where like like right now we could use every little drop of happiness right (laughs) yeah it's true yeah, it's like it's been so rough with the pandemic and everything, and I, um, you know, people being isolated and, and stuff, and just you know having tools available that make us feel happier. And it's not it's not so easy, you know. Like all of a sudden we're at home, and you know we can distract ourselves, but sometimes you know what can we do about our own lives? It's, we haven't really been taught how to self regulate, how to feel happier, and how to make us feel happier. I feel at least I wasn't taught that in in school or somewhere so much so um i think that's that's something what at least technology can help us and um that's what we're trying to do yeah no i love that because there i've been talking to a lot of like psychologists and stuff and they were they were talking about how like this pandemic could be a good thing in a sense of people were forced to stay at home and face who they are truly without any distraction but they also said that could be a bad thing Now, if you get out of that because, you know, you haven't worked on yourself for so long and you're like, oh, shit, like I'm nowhere where I thought I was mentally. So you've got those two. But then you've also got a group of people who didn't do anything because they just didn't know what to do. So their life was kind of on hold. And then there's like this whole extra pressure of I haven't done anything with my life. So, you know, it's that group of people that um, I think you're really going to help. I, I think it's important. And what is a what did they say the, the dangers of it are that mean people getting more into addictions or something or distractions that are not necessarily healthy or what was the concerns of the psychology side? Yeah, so the, um, being being or having to sit down with yourself hmm. can be great for a lot of us. I know it definitely helped me, but when I first got rid of all the distractions in my life personally, I remember being terrified. Because you had done so little work on yourself that having to climb that mountain seemed impossible. And without help, like, you know, you can get therapy online, but it costs money. Some people can't afford it. Like you have no um, external sources for relieving stress, like the gym or 
mm. the library or whatever. So it's literally just you in a room facing yourself. And for some mm. people, they just can't handle that. It's like really intimidating, mm. especially if you've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, so that was kind of the concern. Um, I think overall, generally, there was a big group of people that took it to their advantage. And I think it did come out as a good thing, even though with a pandemic, there's a lot that isn't good. I think that was one of the benefits, but I, there was a select group of people who just couldn't handle it. It was too much. Yeah. And then I do think also, even if, if you start doing the work, it's so much, you know, regarding or just like posture, sometimes nervous system, you know, what we can breathe deeper and all these different tools we can have. But um, I think, you know, like technology can really help us to automate, make that more easier and, and funnier, uh, you know, fun in a way. And that's, and because it's just so much and, and being self-motivated and having the consistency, it just takes a lot. And then you feel like almost like, oh, I'm guilty when I'm not doing it. And I'm, and I'm guilty of, you know, not having the tools available, not knowing what I should do. So I can totally emphasize a lot of people feeling that that's a lot. In addition to all the other stress people already have during the pandemic that are coming on top of, you know, that doing that kind of work. It's, I was thinking the similar what you said um, in the beginning, but realizing that it's it's survival mode during the pandemic. First of all, that's a lot of pressure for people, and then on top of that, doing some self work. It's just it's like way too much to ask oftentimes. So. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and you often hear like I've said it too, where it's like you have nothing but time now. But sometimes that time is like terrifying. Yeah, yeah, because you don't know like what about your family, your friends? Somebody has the virus or or, you know, somebody's got laid off and all kinds of things. Um, yeah, I feel like it's it was it was a lot, uh, or it's been a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I totally, hopefully, you know, not only us, but a lot of other technologies or programs or apps will be out there <clears throat> to help people and make lives more easier and make mindfulness more accessible because it is, it seems sometimes also very intimidating doing self-work, self-care meditation for people so i know that myself I, I only got into yoga because a friend was recommending it for years she always said hannes why don't you try yoga why don't you try meditation and because she knew i you know about my uh you know not being so happy so then i i only tried it when after really bad breakup and you know where my ex left me blue yoga mat and i was like well i might just try yoga you know <laughs> i was like yoga was always that was 10 years ago or 11 years ago so, um, you know, before that, I was so hesitant and oftentimes it takes like be really down to to try something new that was formerly intimidating or we judged on. And but I do think during the pandemic, trying out meditation online or therapy online is a huge step because you can't even go, you know, and kind of like leave the room. It's just like you're like one on one with a therapist on a call or something. It's, it's a lot. Yeah, no, it's awesome. it, like online therapy is good like we need it yeah. like right now we need it but god i like this the zoom gloom is a real thing man like when you're when you're staring oh, at a screen for so long like i i was recently i know this episode's going to come out later but i was recently at like a conference for this organization called jack.org and mm -hmm. it's where like all like 250 young mental health advocates come together for a national conference mm -hmm. but it was all online this year and it was five days. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the end, I just felt so exhausted. And I was like, I haven't Fine. really done anything. I just sat in my chair for five days and looked at a screen, but it drains you, man. It drains you mm -hmm. mentally. It's a different kind of tired. Yeah. And I know like some people even, I've met like some professors, they have one, a man from Hong Kong, he has this technique that you always have to look in the eyes and you know, there's a lot of that too, you know, like holding eye contact and, you know, be more truthful and stuff like that. But you never do that when you do a Zoom call, you know, I'm looking into this, like, I, I always get reminded of like the Stanley Kubrick, um, what's the Space Odyssey, HAL mm -hmm. 9000. I don't know if you've seen that, you know, where it's like this eye, but like it's, it's just the eye of the video, the selfie camera we're looking into, right? Instead, and if I want to look you, if you, if I want to give you the impression that I'm looking you in the eyes, I have to look in the camera you just think I'm looking at you. But if I want to look you in the eye on the screen, I'm looking like I'm looking somewhere else. So 
Um, so in the end, we're looking into the eyes of the machine, <laughs> like, you know, space odyssey or something in that sense. But, um, but yeah, and that's like, it, it feels not so human. So online calls or on meditation sessions or whatever, it's like, you never really look the other person in the eye. And that feels like probably like it gives us some kind of, you know, our brains and kind of, uh, what like confusion, what's going on. I'm, I'm not really looking the person in the eye or something. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably one of the nicest things, like being in presence with other people and being able to look them in the eye, seeing each other smile at the same time <laughs> with no time distortion that sometimes happens on calls or so. Yeah, yeah no, I, I have a real problem with the uh, staring at the camera thing because yeah. like I'm looking at you right now and it feels like we're having a face to face, but I'm not real. This is me looking at you and I can't see you. And I just, oh, yeah. it's so mental. My brain's like, what are you doing? Like, why are you yeah. looking away from him? but yeah. they're not. It's, yeah. And then, and then you'll have like the, the, the person will be talking and all of a sudden you'll hear like a little, like it from zoom, the little bit while they're talking oh. and you remember, you're like, Oh wait, this guy's not in front of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's in a computer. And then that messes with your brain too. It's just, there's so many different factors to zoom gloom. And then once you're done with like days of zooming, you're like, Oh, can oh, yeah. we just go back in person? Mm. yeah it's like that and then because really the fatigue we're looking at and setting up a study now on on um they call zoom fatigue or so um and yeah we're trying to evaluate how we can test what helps maybe with that obviously you can't get really rid of the selfie camera being a little bit away from the screen right now at least i mean that's a hardware issue but how can you at least adapt the screen colors maybe or like we were doing with our company or adjust uh, the brightness to somebody's heart rate or breathing patterns. Because we can mm-hmm. we use the webcam and machine learning to detect, you know, how somebody's breathing. And maybe that would at least be something that is in sync. So obviously we're offering that with our, our uh, product in some capacity for, for browser extension right now. But, you know, when you're on a call that could maybe adjust everything a little bit or, you know, see what helps you to breathe deeper, it um, could be... You know, um, we could make it a little bit more human, humane, because it adapts to our nervous system. And I feel the struggle we have a lot with Zoom fatigue or with a lot of emails, looking at the screen in general, is that it's it never takes our nervous system into consideration. You know, if mm-hmm. we use social media or something, they they sometimes look at what gets us excited or what news and what photos, but they're not really looking at our nervous system. They're looking at our clicks, and so it looks very much on our visual cortex, on like how how our brain processes it and then how we're clicking. So it's just like eye, the brain, you know, and and finger and clicking, but it doesn't really take into consideration how our, you know, heart beats, how our breathing pattern is. And I think oftentimes social media and others, they look at really how how much we are stre- getting stressed out, how much we're getting more excited. And in a way that is like short attention span, you're grabbing our attention, but how can we actually make technology that it's oh, we feel better? Mm-hmm. And then we feel calmer and that we don't have to spend more attention on it. But do we actually feel while being on a Zoom call or being on an app, social media, that we feel, you know, reduced, stress reduced and calmer? And that's, um, that's, I think, would be at least, it would be a huge step because it is, it is really disconnected from our nervous system, from our stress levels right now. But our family is not, our friends or not when we're stressed they tell us probably or you know there's there's some interaction with that but if we're on the screen most of the time most of us are on the screen for an average of 10 11 hours or more even sometimes in the winter time and you know the technology doesn't tell us when we're stressed and we don't notice when we're stressed so that's something our technology does and hopefully others are doing too because it is you know when we're like stressed all the time or we're getting really fatigued it's it's a problem. It's better to take a break sometimes or to, you know, improve our posture, taking a few deep breaths or something, um, adding a smile or so. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, yeah, that's great because the, the problem is the human body is so complex. So like with the technology we have right now, we are so advanced, but we're not mm-hmm. nearly advanced enough to reciprocate what a human, human body can do. Yeah, I think that's the problem. Yeah. And it's like what you say with like a zoo. With an- I was thinking about animals that they're just very adapting to the environment. 
they go somewhere else when they don't like it and they, they give each other comfort in groups and right now technology doesn't really do that it doesn't adapt to us it doesn't so we're almost like you know less than the natural environment for animals because it's not we're not adapting to or only like our brain adapts our visual cortex a little bit but our whole body is you know you can sit like this the whole day and you won't notice because you don't also have a selfie camera oftentimes telling you that and then like at the end of the day this posture is really bad and sleep is bad and stuff but you know having like technology remind us adapt us better posture breathing a little bit deeper you know adding a smile taking a break just you know giving some time, family time, friends time, is, it will be a huge improvement because we're just, we're like more than in a, in a box right now. We're very trapped and very limited in terms of our abilities. Yeah, as you said, we're such a complex, complex beings. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and that's, yeah. The, that's the other thing, right? Like you just mentioned, look, we are complex beings, but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, whether you believe it or not, we're, we're animals. So if you mm -hmm. were to put like, I don't know, a chimpanzee in front of a screen for like 10 hours a day. How do you think it would react? It would go insane. It would start mm -hmm. bashing shit. It would break the computer. It would start screaming. Like at the end of the day, like we're more advanced than a chimpanzee, obviously, but mm -hmm. you know, like we're still going to lose our minds. Yeah. And like embodiment is so important as I feel, you know, when you do, when I will go to a zoo or when I will go out in nature in the park, like I'm walking, my body is engaged. When I'm talking with other people, they will friends, they see how I react, how my posture is, am I comfortable, am I uncomfortable? All of those things when we want technology, it doesn't matter. It's just like what for a lot of programs, it only matters. They sell data when we're getting excited, when we pay attention to something. They don't profit when we are more calm, when we're more at ease, when we spend less time on the screen. A lot of those things in using in technology as software and hardware designed for us to keep us on the devices but not in a way that is embodied that is like presence that has you know a deep breath in there like joy and so that's what, what we're working on and uh, i think hopefully that will be more of a thing in the future like just kind of more embodied more integrated um whole, wholesome technology so people are more efficient when they're using technology and then when they and they can do their task faster because they just like do it with more, you know, if we're more calm, if we're more relaxed, we usually do things faster, actually. And when we're getting fatigued and stuff, it takes us much longer to do tasks. And then so people spend less time on the screen, essentially, when it's more embodied. And, and then they have more time for each other and being in nature and enjoying life and all this attention on the screen. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's way more productive, too, when you feel rested and ready to go. Oh, yeah. What helped so, help you a lot during the pandemic to feel rested? Me? Um, I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, admittedly, I was terrible. Uh, I was on my screen. I remember, you want to talk about stress. I remember I looked at my screen time after like three months in the pandemic, and I think I was averaging nine hours on my phone. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, yeah. it, I've gotten it down to like one or two because nine was atrocious. And I was always like, I don't get why I feel like, I, well, I don't get, I don't get why I feel so terrible. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was like, well, it's right there. Um, nine mm -hmm. hours on your phone is terrible. Um, but then once I started getting into kind of a groove, I mean, this show kept me occupied forever. Uh, it was kind of a blessing in disguise that way. Like I started it before the pandemic hit, but it really took off during. So that helped me a ton. Um, I did a lot of, I, I went for a lot of walks. That, that was it just being in nature as a kid that was like my my escape be as a kid in the forest i would always go if i was stressed if okay. you know i needed a break from reality i'd go in there so walks in the forest helped um i did a lot of yoga i started meditation i'm still not great at it but i did it um and then once things started opening up a little more i started going to uh, muay thai classes like exercise because I was not exercising during the pandemic. Admittedly, it was terrible. Um, yeah, that's just, just things to get my brain going, but also my body because I felt like a slug for like four months and it made me feel going, it made me go insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I do, I did a lot of breath work in the beginning, which also kept me going because I was guiding um, online classes every day. Um, just, 
for free. Um, and then I, I narrowed it down to three classes a week now or so. But that was, that's been really a lot of a workout for me in a way because I think um, breath work is a workout for the inner. And then I got to engage a little bit with people online, and even though they were mostly listening or so. But um, there, there's a lot of benefits on, on breath work. So I, I was able to benefit from that. But definitely took less steps because here in the New York area, people take, you know, 10,000s of steps, just going to subway, going to work and stuff. And they didn't have that trip to the office anymore. So I, I sometimes look, it was like 90 steps a day <laughs> instead of yeah. two. To twenty thousand ninety or something, so definitely not so active now in the springtime. Hopefully, I'll you know I'll take more walks and stuff. It was a it was a really intense winter here too. So. Well, yeah, I was just gonna say like you guys in New York get it. Like in Canada, the winter, like in the summer and the spring, it's easier to get those steps in. But this year, my steps were so bad. I think I was averaging a thousand. Like oh, a that's day. good. In in my case, it would be good. <laughs> I had to force myself to get those steps though. I was like, you have to at least break a thousand. Um, but like the snow was like up to here at some, some points. And if it wasn't, it was like minus 19. Like, how do you go out for a a casual walk at negative 19 weather? Well, there are some techniques that are, you know, incentivizing you in a way to, to, take walks on the cold the Wim Hof method of my my mentor and friend Wim I don't know if you heard about it so it's a it's this cold um, cold exposure method so you're you're supposed to go out in t-shirt or in shorts um in the cold and just to you know take a walk for 15 minutes or an hour or something and maintain your body temperature so that's so that's what I've been doing a few times too um it wasn't as cold it was it was at minus freezing degrees. Um, one of my team members, uh, Bobby, we had like fun cold walks around the park and people looked at us like we're crazy because in New York, people really don't get bothered by anything. Mm-hmm. They, they've they seen all kinds of craziness. But if you're really outside and you've, you've showing that you're physically different or that, you know, you're displaying like a different physicality regarding the super cold environment, they think you're crazy. So... You know, us walking around in T-shirt and smiling and being on the phone, talking with each other while everybody else was wrapped up and there was a cold wind and stuff that was that was really made them think we're crazy. And it was a really good workout, actually. The Wim Hof method um, that's called has mm-hmm. been shown to clinically study to really reduce, uh, to improve immune system function, uh, the nervous system connection with the nervous system it helped a lot of people with anxiety and depression like me and uh it's a little bit hard to do cold walks or cold showers but it's it intensifies the the training because because if you're if you're breathing deep if you're training to breathe deep through your belly it's up that's good but you have to do that type of breathing like really slow deep inhales and slow exhales when you're out in the cold because otherwise you won't sustain in the cold because otherwise you would like tense up and do this type of breathing. And that's the type of breathing is oftentimes what people do when they're on a screen. They're just like, I'm breathing very shallow. So what we're, what the Wim Hof method incentivize or motivates you to do and what our technology does also just taking, actually relaxing more and taking deeper breath. And if you're out in the cold or taking cold shower, it's really better to relax your shoulders to breathe in slowly and and exhale deeply, and it's it's a really good workout when you do the cold walks or cold showers. You get like you flush almost your whole um, blood circulation with oxygen because you get so much more oxygen in. Also, cold air you probably know that, but cold air has uh, there's more air oxygen in cold air because it's more compressed. So mm-hmm. taking deeper breath in in the cold in cold air to get more oxygen and so we also feel that sometimes we feel a bit lightheaded or dizzy because of oxygen saturation changes but we also feel more invigorated some um, because there's so much oxygen coming in so it's like actually very beneficial to trying to get gradually the time up of cold walks um walks in the cold even if it's with with a jacket getting like taking deep breath in and not doing what we're kind of like intuitively sometimes think doing this um, shrugging the shoulder. Um, So obviously it's very similar on the screen sometimes when we're feeling stressed, like instead of doing this, just um, relaxing more. 
but cold walks are really good um, training because in cold showers. So I've been I've been keeping up keeping that up um, sometimes, and I haven't gotten sick all winter. So um, and I haven't gotten sick in six or seven years actually doing this technique and cold shower. So it's been really 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 helpful. And the most the most benefit of that is really the deep breathing you're getting, the awareness mm-hmm. of your breathing, of your body posture, and so I'm so grateful for Vim and his family to for spreading the that so um, so generously throughout the world. Yeah, no, my my brother and I are big fans of his. Um, oh, we, nice. we yeah, no, he, he. I'd love to pick his brain, man. No, we. Um, I I do that in the shower. I, I I'll go for like a really hot shower and then right near the end i'll put it to like freezing just to get my system to go (gasps) and um Mm -hmm. that helps a lot it wakes you up you feel good yeah you feel lighter and the studies say you're supposed to take a cold shower for like a minute and a half to get all the benefits out um so uh i I, i've you know traveled with him and done a lot of projects with him and i always wonder if wonder when I got him to New York for his first workshop here in Brooklyn. Um, first first workshop in New York, and it was five years ago or something almost. I think so. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, I was wondered because there's so much speculation. It's the brown fat activation. Is it? What is it? You know. And so once we were traveling, once I, I was in the car with him. I was like, I'm gonna ask him this question now. What does he think? What does it? What is it? You know. And then, and then he said, it's all will. I said, what do you mean? It's all will. It's not the brown fat. It's not this thing. And he said, no, it's all will. And I was like, wow, you know, this is such a profound saying. So it has so much to do with commitment, with, you know, holding yourself accountable and really doing it and willing yourself to do it. I mean, obviously there are other aspects that you have to, you know, you can't just like will yourself, your body through if you're shaking and you have early signs of hypothermia. He always recommends to stop it. But in the end, to really get to the stage of, constant breathing awareness or deep breathing and obviously just like inner fire he promotes to warm up your body temperature that's all will he says and so in our case in our technology like how can we have technology in a way help that will and so you you display that intention to improve your body but technology you know in a way um and acts that will in a way saying like you know we we guide your nervous system we we check on it we give you break reminders and stuff because it is, it's a hard training. You know, I love Vim's method, and you know, but it is, it's not easy to to take cold showers. It's not easy to take walks and to be consistent with like half an hour or an hour of breath work every day. And a lot of people with family and stuff, they don't really have the time. You know, it's a full time job. My sister has, you know, single mom with two kids. It's a lot to ask for her to take, you know, even like fifteen minutes off with the boys being so active and then studying at night when they're in bed. So it's it, making. Integrating stuff in screens is really my fun. But it was huge when Vim said, it's all will, you know? It's like, wow, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And the the other thing, right, is that, um, like, even if you're not, like, a single mother or you have the time, starting from nothing and going into that process is also intimidating. Uh, so yeah. little baby steps along the way would help a lot. Just, like, you're climbing up the ladders as opposed to jumping right to the top of it. It's a little more doable. Oh, yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, and having that having that will and then you 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 don't do it right away or and then you, you get you think like I can't do it, I'm not good enough, and all those things, and that's legit because it's not legit that to say that I'm not good enough, but it's it's legit to get demotivated because it is it is hard to have that consistency. And obviously what a lot of people sometimes don't know Vim, you know, had a very hard time. You know, his the wife passed his wife passed away his ex-wife back then and he was alone with four kids so it was you know he had to find something and obviously he did yoga before and cold exposure but he he really you know intensified the practice once he was at this really intense stage so so i think it is good to take the lessons from the people who went through such super hard times and make make things easier for people so they don't have to you know think they have to sit down and every day and doing this and not think any thoughts and meditation and stuff but really integrating into everyday technology because you know especially in new york i always felt like new yorkers nobody will take or barely anybody will do go on a 10-day silent retreat like i did you know because i gave myself the time and and i didn't have you know a big house i had to pay or a big apartment or something so 
it's it's not easy for people to take that time out of their day and and then to not feel bad when they don't take the time out so making those things easier i think is very important and more comfortable because a lot of this is also comfort levels and and rightfully so because we're you know we want to enjoy life and we don't want to feel like it's it's a drag you know <laughs> what we're doing mm-hmm. so, so yeah. yeah you don't want you don't want what you're doing to feel like a chore exactly yeah so it, yeah. that 10 day silent retreat a little bit of a tangent is that uh vipassana yeah i did i did a mm-hmm. few of those i did this actually very you know i'm already i'm norwegian german but like being German in a way, I feel like Ashtanga yoga, which is very rigorous, was like <laughs> was like the thing I did right away, and then I did Vipassana, which was very like sit down, not you know, mm-hmm. ten hours a day, meditate in this in the retreats, and then and then you're supposed to you know keep up practice of at least two hours a day, one in the morning and one at night. I did that, and even did more, and so you know very strict and rigorous, and I had to break that being rigorous because that was also not good for me. So <clears throat> I also think. Vipassana is great for many and it was good for me in many ways, but it's also it could be too intense because then you just like you have this very, you know, rigorous meditation practice, which I think there's some some, you know, some voices in the community that express, you know, too much meditation is not good too. And and I think there there's some legitimacy to that. hmm Yeah, you got you gotta find your balance. And everyone's exactly. different. It's like that, that method will work for a lot of people, but it won't work for everybody. And that's the same for literally everything in life. You, you got to take everything with a grain of salt and a lot of trial and error. Love that. Yes. And different things work for different people. I mean, we're always trying to work on, you know, different techniques offered mindfulness practices because pe- some people don't like the body scan. Some people don't like to be aware of their breathing. They just like a simple posture, a movement thing. And it's just like, whatever somebody likes and you can't really like force anything on anybody and shouldn't. And, um, I mean, you know, for me being like rigorous, it was like, I had to also break that. And, um, for other people, it's like being more accountable. And then, you know, there's, there's other th- traits that come along with that being more accountable in terms of meditation, being more accountable in life. For some people it's taking a step back and easing things a bit more. There's so many different routes and so many, every, every situation is different beautifully about balance it's all balanced mm-hmm. yeah i agree so you're... what is like wait like uh, it's like another quote Vim oftentimes says like easy does it even though it's very funny because he always pushes himself to do yeah. these things but i like the quote easy does it and like balance balances everything is also makes sense yeah the easy does it with his training and what he does it's like what <laughs> <laughs> wait that's easy <laughs> yeah it's like, okay <laughs> what, the, what the hell am i doing <laughs> yeah so you, so your your company breathing AI. What what got you started with that? Like where when did that come off the ground? Yeah, that was um, kind of directly coming out of neuroscience research and art science project. So I was um, we had uh, so we had we did neuroscience research on visual stimuli, how people are how brain frequencies are changing with looking at ten thousand different images. And then we're also doing studies um, using fMRI, looking at the blood flow, and and also EEG on the, comparing different meditation techniques. So that was that was our research, and that then led to um, a tech art science project where you could see see how your heart rate is changing, how your breathing patterns are changing in VR and AR. Also, one with Vim, where you see Vim floating, and you see like your own you know living room. You see Vim floating there in through augmented reality glasses. And then you would see your own breathing patterns or your own heart rate. And you would basically go through guided breathing techniques, guided meditation techniques. But even though we won awards, you know, at, for the, it was years of research at Stanford and stuff, it was never really, I was never really comfortable putting a screen in front of people's face in VR and AR because it's just, I don't know, some people, some kids especially felt better with the breathing exercises when it was, well, sea level rise when project was called seeing breath and when they had anxiety their parents said oh the kids go to me to yoga classes in, in one instance or one kid didn't know about ocean sea level rise but they really liked like being immersed in this fun environments and then to breathe deeper and um, they did it again and again and adults too but um, I, d- I just didn't like that you know just like going somewhere and sell trying to sell them basically hardware and, and a program that 
you know, just like it's literally like this closed, you know. So there's not a lot of studies we did on how it affects vision, how it affects in a way a lot of things regarding the, the brightness of this the device. So I'm not a big fan of VR, but for a training programs, it could be good. But I, I, I wanted to make things more accessible and scalable and easier. So we, we started at MIT, I think in 2018, we started to use the, the camera to detect heart rate. And then we set up one program where you, where in diff, you see different visuals, you see different audio, and then you would see what one, which one environment is the most calming for you, for your heart rate. And those are actually, I remember the one, one of the judges came by and tested it and he had the dungeon or the basement was the cal most calming environment for him. Now, I was thinking, why? Why? That was so scary because we really chose it intentionally because it was so claustrophobic to make a point of like, this is for everybody, the most stressful ones. And, and then he said, oh, that makes sense. And we said, why? And he said, because, oh, I used to be an underground DJ. Like, a, you know, and so he was very comfortable with being in the darkness because that made him feel like at night, you know, he was going for hours. And so, so it was a good and a value, um, a good answer in a way to confirm that there might be working what we're testing. And then we did another prototype to show different colors and fonts to people. So you're just sitting in front of a screen desktop, show five different fonts randomized, like a scientific study and, and fonts. And then you would see what's the most calming event, what's on average the most calming color because we showed it to many times. So that was very successful at a conference and it's a transformative technology conference. So I I got a lot of questions from investors. So I think that was 2017, 2018. Oh no, that was 2018. Um, I got a lot of questions from investors. What are you, or are you, you know, what kind of company are you, what kind of startup? And I, I had no idea. So I would just say, tell them, I don't know, like, uh, I just realized I had to start a company in order for them to give me money or under, or just make it scalable because nobody at that time was working on similar technology. And I always thought like, oh, somebody will pick up the research we're doing and just do a business out of it or something. So nobody was doing that. So I, I had to start it myself in a way. And then I got my patent granted for this type of technology where I was also surprised that nobody had a patent on this technology. but. Um, I'm glad we got it because you know we're happy to license it out for companies that are invested in well-being and then so yeah it's been like well that was December 2018 when I started the company and very much inspired by that research but obviously driven by my personal story on healing from depression and anxiety and knowing that a variety of tools helped me and I had to go a very intense path to do it but I want people to feel better more easily and more make it really accessible with a click that you know you can test out different techniques that you can while you're on your screen it could be more comfortable and that's really what motivated me to make it as accessible for people and yeah now we're really dedicated team so grateful for them um, and especially the last year we've worked so hard to launch our product and um, it's been so i kind of like the first year 2019 was a bit slow when i started the business because and then 2020, I tried to use because I started to because there was there was not a lot of traction for this technology. A lot of a lot of people were looking into you know how to detect stress level. Using the webcam was very uncomfortable for people. It was intimidating. It was intimidating to have your stress level monitored. People were always arguing, "Well, who needs this really? They can just take a walk in the office, go you know, grab coffee." So it was really during the pandemic when this whole industry got speed up five years. And people were comfortable all of a sudden with webcams. I mean, we're talking about, the, you know, it's a, there's a discomfort with it after a while, but in general, people use it more. So, um, and people are more on their screen. So there's obvious and remote work will probably not go away, at least for a lot, a lot of people. So, so there, there needs to be a solution for remote screen work. And I think we're, we're that we can be that one of those solutions. And um, so really the last year, the, the first half of the year, I, I used um, breathing and ice technology for a COVID-19 project called Vital Sign AI, where we had about almost 200 volunteers, but it was really hard to maintain that because clinical data and clinical institutional partnerships and stuff are really hard to come by. And I didn't want to run like a medical company in a way or many. So I, I switched back to digital health, like breathing AI um, later last year, 2020. and 
And so since then we've been developing our product and um, and improving it. And uh, yeah, and so so that that got me back. I, so it's so it's been it could have been a little bit faster in terms of last year when I wouldn't have done the COVID nineteen project, but I wanted to see how we can use our technology for you know to detect stress level, to detect shallower breathing patterns, early symptoms of COVID nineteen eventually. But I, I scaled back from that because it's just like so cost intense and it really wasn't my expertise. So now we're with Breathing AI, a digital health startup that really offers people the most easily accessible mindfulness reminders, break reminders, and helps them feel better on the screen. And I'm all for that. And it's very it's, it's gratifying to, to work on something like that and 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 to grow it and um, grow it, you know, with good partnerships of companies that are value aligned and not to compromising on on the values, you know, because it's it's in, it's in very intimate what we're detecting. We're detecting people's breathing patterns, heart rate, and so we want to make sure that those d- data stay on their devices and stay locally. And if they share that with us, that we use that to improve our algorithms and that we don't sell that secretly, like um, other personal data has often been done in technology and in business. So we're aware, we're aware of that, and you know, the trust of the users and the well-being of the users is at the core of what we're building. And that's also very, you know, fun and it feels very responsible to do that. So, so in a way, it's my personal story, but in the end, it's it's um, it's uh, it's a lot of research, a lot of neuroscience, a lot of patent invention going in there, and a lot of dedicated teamwork. So, I I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be where it is without my team, and uh, that remotely it is still a lot of teamwork, and I'm grateful for that because it also kept me somewhat sane, you know, <laughs> to do to build this together. So it's been been quite a journey for for a little bit over two years, um, but yeah, that's got me that got me started. Awesome, yeah, no, that um, that trust is important because you're hearing about that in the news now, right? Like with all these uh, like Facebook and whatever, they're selling all this information. I didn't read too much about it, but it's like that trust needs to be there. And yeah. y- your company is still pretty young. Do you think that like a little bit of that pushback I- originally? was because they just people didn't understand this new technology that you're presenting? Yeah, I think that's that's one thing, but also I think like turning on the webcam, having the webcam turned on was not so regularly done before when it was somebody I would ask you for a video call, right? Before the pandemic it was oftentimes a little bit more odd because you go on a call, you you meet in person. Um, so now it's almost it's, it's the norm. You use the webcam all the time. And there is literally people, a lot of investors and business telling me who needs to detect stress levels? Like, how could that be a business? And we, we're not only detecting stress levels, but we're detect- we are also offering the mindfulness and break reminders. And that was before the pandemic. And now there are companies that are only detecting stress levels, which is like what we have integrated into our technology. And there are companies that are only offering mindfulness solutions without the stress monitoring. So we're combining both and those other companies are gigantic companies alone, just offering, you know, um, mind meditation apps and stuff. And so we're combining that and making it more accessible for people. So, so that's something that before the pandemic was, was very considered of like, how could this be a business? (laughs) So that's what I struck, but that's what a lot of people told me. And obviously you need to build out the technology and and prove a case and just published another paper at, um, that was published at like a very renowned interface conference at, at Texas A and M University and Cornell a panel by Cornell Tech and so everything we're doing is very science driven and um, our user research team is very big and Natalie and her team there they they're always testing things so it's very much focused on the user and and very science driven and um, and then you know making a business out of that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah no that's awesome i I, yeah it's funny how um like people's opinions can change so drastically in a year like in 2019 people are going why the fuck do we need this stuff and then in 2020 they're like oh we really need this stuff (laughs) it's like like a couple months just change their perspective completely because you're not in the you're not in the office anymore you can't go for those coffee breaks you can't go for that drive to from work you're waking out of bed you're rolling on the floor and your desk is right there like that's that's your world now. So it's really important what you guys are doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's, we, we had so many 
people join us just also like wanting to interim and work with us and um because they, they see the value in this and it's really just a just really a testament in a way to you know how this pandemic has changed the world also and and how how dedicated people are to well-being and to helping each other out and and see in finding solutions that help everybody and not to you know with so many people work with us and then they they left because they had to obviously like take on a job to stay in their family but they, um when we need more help but it's so great so i'm so inspired by humans you know working on solutions like this or others and helping each other instead of you know getting distracted and doing all kinds of proud to not help and not to spend some extra time on, on solutions that help mankind so a very very inspiring also to see how you know humans help each other out across the world we, because we work with people from all over sometimes and get knowledge there and yeah <clears throat> Yeah, no, humans, yeah, you, you nailed it. Humans are so inspiring sometimes. Sometimes you lose faith a little bit because you're on social media and you're looking at all the clickbait stuff and you're like, yeah, we're going down a path that we shouldn't be. But then you hear stories like this and you're like, oh, okay, we're, we're still okay. <laughs> we, still, yeah. we still got some stuff going for us. <laughs> I think it's like the way technology has been set up so far and a lot of businesses to it that's very like profit driven and attention grabbing like in the mm. west coast they have this thing about center for humane technology and others they always talk about like this attention economy so how are we driving attention away from it so i think there should be should be looked at how how attention is being monetized and personal data are being monetized and when we are using social media and then our fear evokes a certain attention and and certain interaction with us and then they they sell that interaction what what are we re reacting to what are we looking for and sell that to companies and then we are getting presented certain advertisements which oftentimes happens right sometimes we even talk about it and the the phone picks it up because we give access to the microphone um, i think in case of like the biggest social media company i think that is the case so then you get next time you get presented those advertisements so i i like the proposals where we get we're supposed to get some of that money or, or we have to consent to sell those data because that kind of clickbait, as you mentioned, is ben is there is somebody's benefiting of that. That's why that is happening. So hopefully in the future, there's going to be, you know, a business set up, like it, things are be set up in a way that our well-being is also considered. And, you know, there's like a, there's a profit we're making if we're feeling better when the company's making. So what we, how we're setting it up is like a win, win, win for everybody and not like a, you know, oh, we're, we're kind of like you're kind of winning, but you also be a little bit more fearful. And then, yeah, we're actually selling your bio data, your personal data out. You know? That's what a lot of social media companies are doing. And then admitting that in Congress or uh, later on, and there's not a lot of laws about it. So I think um, things could be set up a little bit differently, favorably for the users, and um, then favorably for for companies that are supporting the users' well-being and not secretly monetizing off their data and that's it's i mean it's gigantic amount of money that's being made with uh personal data being sold without really without consent or without knowledge you know you click this like terms and conditions oftentimes and we don't really know what's in there we just know that our friends are using this platform so we're going to click it and we're going to use it but then we don't know that we give access to you know all of our history of of our emails or sometimes like that right if it's like a program that detects all of our grammar that corrects grammar and maybe we give access to all of our emails in the past and then they, they can sell our interests to a company so all of those things are very very elusive right now and not very defined and not we as users don't know about it and i think there should be should things should be done about it um people should be informed more and um steps been taken that people's right you know people's personal data are protected and and it's not that it stops businesses just like different forms of businesses will benefit from that then more or the big businesses have to reshape themselves and right now big tech companies are oftentimes you know they're they're profiting of they're maximizing their profit so the maximizing profit is clickbait and that's like fear 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 and and then that's also part of human condition to like focus on the negative because then you protect yourself like being aware of the negative thing as you probably know well you know with, with animals like they like they like a negative thing they have to be on alert mode because you know they have to protect their family and their environment so similar i think with social media and stuff but um 
And yeah, but I, I do think like if we feel better, if we feel calmer, we're regulating more, then we're more aware of those things that are trying to manipulate our nervous system. And that's what, that's when we're at our best and other, um, you know, and um, can help each other out and, and help ourselves more. So. Mm-hmm. What's crazy to me is that they, they admit to this stuff. Yeah. And we ju- we're just kind of like, okay. <laughs> yeah, because it's, like, it's so much part of our lives, right? I mean, yeah. how do you want to live a life without social media for a lot of comp- small businesses like ours? We have to use it just to promotion and stuff so I reach people. And remotely, yeah. Even even for my like for my show and my platform, like I, I tell people all the time, if I didn't have to, you know, promote this stuff, I wouldn't be on there. But like how mm-hmm. there's no other way. <laughs> like yeah. that, that's what the world is now. It is, yeah. And uh, I do think there should be there should be some regulation for those big tech companies of how they're dealing with the personal data. So it gives it opportunities for other tech companies who are actually really invested in the community to thrive more because it's just, they have so much money. It's just, I mean, the amount of money they have and the amount of things they can do because they have, they mm-hmm. control all this like attention and network is, is really, um, yeah, you can't even, it's all, it's hard to fathom the amount of, of, of access they have in a way to personal data and to collective data, I think. So yeah, they can swing, they can swing elections easily like they did mm-hmm. right in 2016 in a way by giving access to data and or helping swing elections in that sense. So, um yeah yeah the the power they hold is terrifying no yeah. uh negative uh <laughs> it was mm. true it's true it's like and and hopefully there's going to be some regulations and they're going to look into it and and users become more aware of it because it's the hard like if if it's all about us to being coming aware of it and all about personal responsibility in this sense i, I get it but those devices we're using those companies were or those apps they are benefiting of us not knowing about it. So mm-hmm. why would they, and those are the devices and interfaces we use to acquire knowledge. So why should they build the algorithms in a way that we find out about those things and that we become motivated to do something about it? They're not because that's not in their interest to do that. So they're building the algorithms that we get fat things that are feeding our fear in a way. So um, yeah, it's a very, there needs to be something happen. And I think it's, it's the time for that because um, stress levels are, you know, and screen time is at all time high. So um, we got to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm hoping things change. Um, in, in terms of your company, uh, is it out to the public yet? Or are you guys still doing tests? Yeah. we like um, the, the launch of our um, browser extension is April. So, um, so yeah, that's where, we're we're always improving. It's just, so like the beta version, but definitely like um, working on the browser extension more to make break reminding break reminders, stress monitoring, the the personal data stay locally, um, and uh, just you know giving people like a timeline of like how was their breathing rate, how was their heart rate while they're on the browser, and then developing it not right now for operating systems for for mobile devices. And so, yeah, we're pretty very dedicated and motivated team. So the browser extension was our first product, but um, we're we're extending on that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, oh, what was my question for you? Do you think AI? So, oh yeah, sorry. So how um how can people like can people sign up for it, or is it just like a a browser thing that you look up on the internet? Yeah, they can look it up either through the um, through the browser, the Chrome store, and um, to look for Breathing AI, or they can sign up or get, acquire it through our website. That's also Breathing.ai. So very simple. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks for asking. Does me. do you, do you guys uh, do you guys do any work with uh, like blue screen or blue light? Sorry. Yeah, that's good. that's a good question. Actually, <clears throat> one of the research lab we've been working with NSSR lab and Ben Van Buren, Professor Ben Van Buren's, um we're talking about that and we're, we're testing, we're studying how different colors um, affect, you know, stress levels, performance, and so on. But there's also studies he shared with me that um, blue lights, not necessarily, uh, there's not like a clear correlation between blue lights and uh, uh, melatonin levels. So mm-hmm. for some people that might work, but blue light, but I mean, I always see it that way, like blue light is because 
right? The, the sky is not there anymore. And then we're supposed to, you know, the melatonin levels are changing because we're, we're getting ready to bed because we're used to live without artificial light for most of human's history. So our bodies are built that way. But I feel like for generations also, we grew up with different types of lighting situations. So maybe that changed and people not always associate green with nature. They sometimes might associate green with something else like um, with stress even or so if if green was presented during the childhood with stress or so 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 there's not like that clear correlation in terms of like how humans always respond to blue lights and how our technology does it is like looks at each person's stress levels the heart rate and their breathing patterns and then adapts the screen color the screen brightness to each user individually and continuously and so not making that like a generalized thing and saying always like oh this is blue light has this impact really looking at is it is it a blue filter is it a is it a orange filter is it a more purplish filter or a grayish filter it could be very different depending on each user's nervous system it's a good question yeah and uh, uh, it's still like like in development and in research and uh, there's different conflicting studies and we're trying to make you know use our algorithms or technology to evaluate those in real time for the user mm -hmm. and in terms of uh in terms of fonts what what kind of font was found to be the most calming. Yeah, it's, a, it's like, I remember a fun story when we showed Comic Sans, right? That's like a fun, fun font. It was very like playful in a way, but people, mm -hmm. it's like a hate or love font. So when we displayed Comic Sans, some people really said, how could, my heart rate was all the way up. Obviously, who can, who can, who would ever like that font? <laughs> and then, you know, another person like a few minutes later was sitting there and showed the results. It's, uh, it's on our YouTube video from like a few years ago, 2018 from that conference. And then another person was sitting there like, oh, yeah, I really like that font. And it was the most calming, comic sounds, you know? And it's, a, it's, so, it's so different. And I'm not sure if there's like one that was more, as I don't, yeah, we don't have enough data or I don't feel like comfortable enough to say like that's the most general. But I don't think there was like a strong reaction to Arial um, font like that. Um, there's oftentimes a stronger reaction to like those comic sounds or typewriter and stuff like that. People liked it or not liked it, but maybe those those are most most calming because they're like on average like Arial and um, Jeremont and so. But we're it's still it's very individually a very huge difference sometimes, and it's it's fun to watch that anyway because it's like, what. Somebody really likes this type of font, but it's personal preferences and different design styles, and so so it's all it's all good. Yeah, it's so I found that so interesting when I was reading up on all of this. Like it, it you don't even take those things into consideration. Like mm -hmm. when you're surfing through the web or you're re typing something or you're reading something, you never think like, yeah, this font is getting my heart rate up. Mm -hmm. Like I'm really stressed looking at this font. Like mm -hmm. you hear, you hear about it with colors. You're like, Oh, like you hear the typical, like red gets you stressed, like a generalization and like blues calm or something. I'm not quite sure what the, the thing actually was, but you never hear about font. Mm -hmm. You just assume it's all the same. Yeah. But then when, when somebody, I remember a friend of mine had her Android changed to all comic sans, I think. <laughs> so whenever she was opening up like the social media app, it was comic sans. And I just noticed like, wow, that's such, that would be so different for me to look at this every time I open it. And yeah. I mean, I have iOS, but uh, no promotion there. I love all of those devices. Um, but uh, I can't, I don't think I can change it that like my whole operating system has one font or I have to look at it, maybe in the latest version I can. But for Android users, sometimes it's easier to change it. And then it's more, then you get it right, you know, in your face in a way it's like, wow, really that, changing a font style for everything on my on my screen uh, on my phone will really like impact me <laughs> impact my stress levels yeah mm -hmm. yeah so when when you guys when breathing ai so when take me through when someone signs up for it like what are the first steps that someone goes through in your program yeah there's an onboarding process so um so our ux team has been evaluating until um yeah basically until end of march um like a lot of different testing phases. They started in July last year, um, looking at how do you onboard somebody, you know, so like showing different colors, color, you can choose your own color preferences, then detecting how, you know, how's your heart rate, how's your breathing pattern while you're looking at these different colors um, in a randomized order. So like a scientific study in a way, 
and then also choosing different break reminders so what are the do you want a movement do you do you want to like also address eye eye strain do you want to address fatigue so like different categories and so you you kind of create your own profile and your own profile profile is being created in, in sync with our technology and uh and then you basically it runs in the background and you can set automatic break reminders or manually break reminders so you have you either get like um, reminded when you're getting more stressed or it comes up every 20 minutes or every hour if you like you know so and then you can click it away and um, you can give access to the webcam to have your stress level detected or you can like turn that off feature off so and obviously we won't collect personal data First of all, it's also like not even legal to do that, like personal identifiable data to just take that on our end without consent. Um, so it's a lot of those data will stay locally and then, um, you know, it would use our technology. And um, so, yeah, it would just basically be on a browser and then we're working on developing it for operating systems and for mobile devices as well, which is a little bit more complex because, you know, if, you, if you're on your desktop and you're working and using webcam, you're just kind of static. So you're not changing your posture, so that we don't need that many. Uh, there's not so much noise in that sense in technology. So if you would move your phone, there's a lot more noise. You know, like the lighting conditions are changing, movement and stuff. So, so it's a little bit more complex to develop it for mobile devices, and it's easier to do this onboarding and and this kind of continuous monthly monitoring on um, on more static devices like desktops and computers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that's so interesting. And I like I get um, I get why people would be a little off put by it. Like, I'm at, like, I can just imagine because when I'm told like, hey, you're slouching, I'm like, hey, fuck you. Like, what are, what are you talking to me like that for? But I also I feel like your program is very beneficial, especially right now, because the thing about the like the fact that we are all online right now. Yes, when the pandemic gets lifted and when we're out of quarantine, that'll change. But I don't think it'll change that much because mm -hmm. I think companies are starting to realize the efficiency of online work, like mm -hmm. the amount of like the the easy access to their employees. Like when you have meetings, you don't have to call everyone in. It's just a click of a button for school. Like lectures are just a video that you post up. I I don't know if I'm a fan of it, but I do think that it's going to come into play more in the future mm -hmm. as opposed to us just going back to normal where technology was just used for movies and social media and stuff. So I, I definitely think that your program is very about valuable. I think this, okay. this will really help people because a, a lot of us forget that, you know, you can garner stress just from your posture, just from your breathing, just from reading certain things, just from the color of your screen. Mm -hmm. And I think people just need a, you know, a reminder. <laughs> frankly yeah and i mean i i am glad that like it, that this breathing awareness is there either through technology or sometimes it's like just like oh my god i'm getting i notice i'm getting tense but it's also like i don't know that sometimes on the screen because as we said earlier it's like very disconnected from our nervous system so i might stay on there for a while and be like oh, i haven't really taken a deep breath or and just something as simple as you know when you do breathing techniques the simple diaphragmatic belly breathing <sighs> improves like our blood oxygenation so much it's crazy and because we have 500 million alveoli in our lungs so it's like just like little spheres and mm -hmm. so it's like if we're breathing very shallow we we don't really nurture them and so taking a deep breath in <sighs> would really just and the letting go axial improves getting so much oxygen to all of those and it's it's oftentimes invisible because we don't see it right away. We don't see our inner organs. We don't see our lungs. We don't see our heart. So that's why we probably don't take care of it that much because we're such a visual culture. But just a simple letting go axial improves the, the oxygen amount we're getting twice. So it's, there's a study on UCLA. So just something like this will improve our blood flow right away twice. So oftentimes people feel like I feel sometimes a little bit dizzy and lightheaded when I'm mm -hmm. just taking a like a sigh but a sigh without a sigh we would die literally during the day so just that reminder of like hey taking a little bit of a sigh it relaxes our shoulders and improves our blood flow it's so simple um yet it's not always there as a reminder because culture is not set up and technology is not set up to remind us and to train us that way so that's what we're trying to that's what we're building to that training and that that guidance for people to to remind them to help them to breathe better and to feel better Mm -hmm. and perform better 
Yeah. I feel, I feel like sighing also in all our culture is considered like rude. Cause you're always like, <sighs> they're like, what's your problem? Oh. You know, as opposed to like, yeah. Hey, I'm just feeding oh my, my avioli. What, why is that though? Yeah. Why is that though? Like you let go of stress. Well, this, this culture is also not set up to, to stress reduction. You're like not supposed to stress reduce. I mean, now it's getting more, but I feel when I grew up, it's always like six pack. And I feel like a six pack is really limiting for your breathing because you really restrict yourself. I remember a friend of mine, he was a, he was a competitive weightlifter. He said he felt the most anxious ever in his life when he was like always having this, wear this tight um, shirts and stuff for like mm-hmm. competitions and stuff or dresses. And it had this always a six pack and he felt never more tense back then. And so letting go of tension in our belly and to allow ourselves to breathe deeply is really not frowned upon because you're not supposed to have a bigger belly. Um, even through, you know, if it's not through, um, so if it's, it could be so deep breathing that you have a bigger belly and it's, it's really stress reducing your, your health is better, but you're not supposed to do that. So I feel like we're living in a society that, it, that, um, rewards you for, for looking stressed and feeling stressed because you're always like, especially here in New York, people oftentimes, you know, are in like stress mode, hyperactive mode. And if you're not, you, they almost think like you're not productive. You're not, you can't survive in New York if you relax because you're supposed to be on high stress alert. And so, so I think that's a lot when you just like take, give yourself a break. It's frowned upon maybe because like, hey, you're not supposed to take a break. We're all in stress mode or <laughs> something. Mm-hmm. And that's, how, that's, that's my conclusion because otherwise it doesn't make sense. It's not, I think it's rude to just be like, or something. It's yeah. Very well, like, we, performance oriented culture. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the problem, right? We live in a very performance oriented culture. We, we live in a culture where, um, it, people compare themselves to others too much. Everyone's just trying to be top dog and they don't care what it takes to get to the top. I like where I live and I'm not going to name drop the town, but um, you know, you can tell like there's been like, we have one of the highest foreclosure rates in my province because people are just striving to be better than their neighbor. They're just mm-hmm. buying all these things. They're working hard. They never rest. They don't care. Like they don't talk to their families and it's just like, if that doesn't, you know, summarize what we are as a society right now, I don't know what does. It's like, you don't care about your well being. You care about being better than the person next to you. Mm-hmm. So I think that is changing. I think, especially with the lockdown, people had to sit down and go, wow, we are really not going in the right direction. Um, but it's going to take a while to change it. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's wild because if you feel happier, like, well, who cares? I mean, you know, what do you, what should you care about? Like what your neighbor does, if you feel like happy, like what, what more can you achieve in life in a way to feel healthy and happy um, and to share that. And it's like, if it, I think it's comes from a lack of not knowing how to feel happy and then mm-hmm. not feeling happy in the first place to like, think like, Oh, I'm like, if I'm having this, then I, I, I get gratitude or I get a gratification out of feeling better than the other person but it doesn't really like it's it's like not real happiness so how, how can we change this society and technology and and businesses to to people emphasize to feel happy and to um, feel healthy and then and then you know you just rest in yourself and the rest comes in a way and you don't want to feel better than you don't want to feel better than your neighbor you want to help them feel better um mm-hmm. if you feel good already so Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a message I want to tell people is like, you know, we live in a world where happiness is viewed as lazy Mm -hmm. and it's really not Mm -hmm. like, I think that's why some people or a lot of people, I don't know. I don't want to speak for people, but I feel like that's why they're afraid of getting that happiness. They're afraid of getting that like inner Mm -hmm. comfort almost because they're scared of being Mm -hmm. viewed as lazy because most of the time the route to that true happiness isn't the grind 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 i'm better than you i'm better than you Mm -hmm. yeah and it's like it's like what what are you getting out of like this competitive mode more stress in a way and also i feel the values are like if that's the main value to be competitive at all costs then you know it comes at the cost of our planet and of each other and society Versus like if, if the competition is for helping each other and the planet, then 
if happiness is part of that and being sometimes a little bit more laid back, then let's do it, you know? Um, because like sometimes like people take on all kinds of jobs or positions just to be active, but then those jobs are contributing to, you know, global warming or, you know, injustice in society, which like sometimes it's better to not take those jobs or not to do support that and and rest a little bit and find the job that is really helping everybody. Um yeah. But I guess like then it gets political or so <laughs> and then it's dangerous yeah. territory. But, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a tough rabbit hole to get out of once you get started. You just keep falling down. You're like, and this and that, but yeah, you know, that's, that's, it, that's it's, it's tough. <laughs> but yeah, so, it's so grateful for your work, man. Like it's like um sharing what one makes people happier, like sharing their their projects and small businesses and stuff. And um, you know, sharing your own story, it's like um very grateful for that. It's great. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, no, and I love what you do. Um, I think it's really important. Where where can where can my I know we already mentioned that the website's breathing.ai, but where can my viewers find you if they have any questions or anything like that? Yeah, I'm like I'm also like on um on social media there stuff. So if there are any questions, and then I have a meetup group where um usually have like three, at least one to three like meetups too and um sharing like different techniques that help and you can explore that and um yeah so i'm like happy to, to chat there and so and yeah thanks Perfect, for asking me. Me. yeah of course nice. um nice. I'll, I'll put all those links down below hannes thank you so much for joining me today man this was this thank was a lot of so fun much, i i appreciate it nice i love the background too and like your your family photos and thank you yes yeah. nice. I got all this what? stuff from Kijiji, uh, or no, not Kijiji. I got it from Amazon on uh, Christmas. Trying oh, to wow. pack it all out. Yeah. So feel pretty nice. good. <laughs> and that's your family in the front? Yeah. My brother and sister. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. They're still in, uh, in your area? Or are they? Uh, well, they're, they're off in uni right now, like university. Uh, yeah. I just finished. So they'll, they'll nice. be coming soon. They'll be, they'll be here soon. My family's all in Europe. So, um, far away mm. but, uh, yeah family is precious yeah man yeah and yeah that that's an important rule that we learned this year too oh, yeah. Fam family's important i think we forget that sometimes because we're so bald annoyed by them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you forget that you'll you'll miss them getting on your nerves every now and then oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. That's cool. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, to all my viewers, I will see you guys next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching another episode of my show. If you want more episodes of the H panel, the button's going to be right here. If you want to subscribe for more videos from myself, it'll be right down below. Please like, comment, share, give five stars. Let's keep this conversation going, guys. All right. I'll see you next time. Thank you for your support.